All right, everyone. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Axel. Um, Axel is currently doing a PhD in quantum information theory with a focus on quantum networks at QTEC in Delft. And that basically means that he's developing the tomorrow's or the future version of the internet, um, which would be a quantum internet. And he's an active developer on the quantum open source project Simulacron, which he's going to talk about, but also QELK and CQC Python. And he gave a talk at last year's FOSTEM, and today he's going to talk about um, this project Simulacron, a simulator for developing quantum internet software. So please welcome Axel. Thank you. It's, uh, it's really great to be back here. Uh, as, as mentioned, I was here last, last year. And uh, it's really nice to be back, because last year I got really motivated on making Simulacron, which I'm going to present, uh, better and easier to use. Uh, so since then, there's a lot of things that happened. For example, it's much more easy to install. It's now on uh, a, a package on PyPy. Um, and there's a command line interface, so it's very easy to use, which I will show later in this talk. Um, and maybe, as Mark mentioned, one should not apologize in a talk. But I should maybe apologize, because this track is called Quantum Computing. And I won't talk about quantum computing. I'll talk about quantum networks. Uh, and uh, this is joint work with my professor, Stephanie Weiner. Uh, ooh, is there some uh, feedback? It's OK. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk too loud. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. So uh, as mentioned, I'm in, uh, in QTEC in Delft as my uh, last year in my PhD. Uh, and we're also part of the Quantum Internet Alliance in Europe, uh, KIA. Um, so in Delft, we're trying to build a quantum network. And maybe just to get a feeling for it's very, uh, <laughs> should I? Uh... Is it OK? Or should I? I don't know if I should. Yeah. Uh, just to get a feeling for who's in the audience, who ever heard about the notion of a quantum network before? A few? OK, that's excellent. Then I can uh, maybe, by the end of this talk, we will have a lot more that knows about quantum networks. Uh, so in a very simple picture, a quantum network is essentially a set of small quantum computers connected by quantum channels. So they can exchange qubits. And they can uh, generate entanglement between each other. Uh, and at QTEC, we're not only thinking about this sort of theoretically, but we're actually building such a network at the moment in the Netherlands between four cities, uh, so between Delft, Leiden, uh, The Hague, and Amsterdam. And we currently have essentially a link between uh, Delft and The Hague, we're, and we're starting to testing it now. Um, with essentially a, a measurement point in, in Dreiswijk, which is between Delft and The Hague. And this is a distance of roughly 25 kilometers. And then we will extend this to also uh, have a link to Amsterdam, which is roughly 50 kilometers. Uh, so this is coming up. Um, so you might ask, OK, why do we want to build a quantum network? Why is this interesting? Um, and the reason, of course, is that we can do a lot of cool things if we have such a network. There are a lot of applications for a quantum network. And is there anyone that, for example, knows one application that you can run on a quantum network, which you can't do on a classical network? Perfect. So the most famous is, of course, quantum key distribution, which is very nice to have being able to generate key, which you can use for uh, secure communication. But this is not the only one. There's a lot of other things that you can, for example, better uh, have better synchronization of clocks. You can extend the baseline of telescopes. You can do blind quantum computation and a lot more things, like secret sharing, anonymous transfer, and so on. And for essentially all of these things, what we need is entanglement. Uh, and this is basically the, the, the fundamental operation that a quantum network uh, enables you to do. So maybe in, in comparison to a, a classical network, where essentially the, the fundamental operation is to send a classical message from one node to another, you might then think that, OK, in a quantum network, the fundamental operation is to send a qubit from one node to, to another. But in our view, this is not really the case. So here, the fundamental operation is to generate entanglement. And the reason being that you can then use this entanglement to send qubits uh, using teleportation. Now, 
we don't want to just build a quantum network, a small quantum network, um, but we want to go further. So we want to have a scalable design and be able to have essentially a quantum internet in the end. And furthermore, we don't want this to be essentially a large hard-coded experiment, but this should be a universable, universable programmable uh, network where you can run any application you want. And it's more, it's essentially a service provided for anyone that wants to run an application. But for this, we need a lot of things to help you abstract, for example, the hardware away. So you don't, you shouldn't have to think about how do we encode qubits, how do we generate entanglements, all these things. So one thing that we need is, for example, a quantum network stack, similarly to, for example, TCP IP in the, in the classical network that abstracts certain functionalities away for you. And we have a proposal for such a quantum network stack and also protocols for a, so a link layer protocol uh, and a network layer protocol, network layer protocol that generates entanglement between, uh, in the link layer protocol between nodes that are directly connected and the network layer protocol generates entanglement between nodes that are not directly connected in the network. Now, a network stack is not the only thing you need uh, that connects essentially an application and the hardware, because you also want to do, for example, gates, local gates on your nodes. And for this, we need essentially a full-fledged operating system between an application and hardware that enables you to do generate entanglements, do local gates, do scheduling of applications, do memory management, et cetera, et cetera. And what this does enables you to do is to, you as a programmer that wants to write some application, you don't need to think about what is actually the hardware in this network and how is it physically implemented. So the hardware might be uh, nitrogen vacancies in diamonds or ion traps or atomic ensembles or whatever. You don't, you don't need to know about this. Um, and in a more expanded picture, um, essentially, we envision that the, the, we call it the Q node OS, or the quantum node operating system, essentially has different, you could call it drivers for different hardware. So it has a hardware abstraction layer for, for example, these envy centers or ion traps, um, which is specific to that hardware. So that's maybe very nice, but then you might think, okay, I want to write one of these applications. How do I then communicate with this operating system. And this is where uh, CQC comes in, and this is an, an interface that we defined. It stands for the Classical Quantum Combiner, uh, CQC. And this specifies essentially what instructions should an application send to the QNode OS to specify what it wants to do. And our goal is not only to have this in, uh, in an abstract world in simulation, but the network we are building should uh, uh, be compatible with this CQC interface. So uh, you as a user, perhaps, could write an application on, on, on your own and then communicate with this network uh, using CQC. CQC is essentially an instruction set. Um, we define the, defines a set of instructions uh, encoded in, in some binary formats. So it's not really meant to be used uh, directly, but we uh, written essentially libraries which enables you to write an application that um, in a more easy way that essentially then um, creates these CQC instructions for you. So for example, we have one which is maybe the, the most easy to use, one library in Python where you can write your applications. They send out CQC instructions. Um, but CQC is essentially, it's both hardware independent, but it's also language independent. So we also have, uh, oh, I should maybe, it was a wrong order here. <laughs> so um, you might wonder, okay, I want to write one of these applications today, but we don't have this network yet. And this is exactly where Simulacrons comes in. So it's a replacement for now until we have the actual hardware. Uh, to write these applications, and it can understand this CQC interface. Uh, so you can already now today write your application using this Python library. It sends out CQC instructions and uh, sends these to Simulacron. But we also have libraries, for example, in C, uh, in Rust, 
Um, and what's nice with this is that we can have essentially a community. So people can develop their own libraries in possible uh, other languages. So there's also now actually uh, an implementation in Java uh, from Johan Voss in, uh, at Gluon HQ, which is uh, uh, an open pull request at the moment for their simulator uh, Strange. Um, there was also an implementation in Go during one of our uh, hackathons we organized. Uh, I'm not sure it was fully finished, and I don't know exact status of this, but I think it's somewhere out there. Um, but if you have another favorite language and you want to write your, your library, uh, that's, that's really great. So not only can CQC talk to Simulacrum, but it can also talk to other simulators, which understands CQC. So at QTech, we also have a different uh, simulator, which is called NetSquid, which is actually a discrete event simulator for quantum networks. And maybe some of you have heard about, for example, NS3 for classical networks, which also does a discrete event simulation. And this is the world's first discrete event simulator for quantum networks. And it's hopefully going to be released in the coming months, and is currently in beta. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, in the future when we have hardware, you should also be able to communicate uh, with the hardware using CQC. So you can already today write your application in one of these languages, and without uh, much change, when we have the hardware, you can then run your application on this hardware. Um, so I'm, I'm saying without much change, because we have not maybe found the perfect uh, uh, ver version of CQC. It's currently in version 2. We're working on version 3 at the moment, um, which has some more improvement in, for example, memory management and how you can maybe do uh, classical logic in your, in your program. So maybe more about Simulacron. So what's cool about Simulacron is not only that it understands CQC, but it's actually a distributed simulation. So I can install it on my laptop. You can install it on your laptops. And we can together simulate a quantum network um, using uh, classical communication in the background. Um, so we can set up a, a network like this on maybe three computers. We all run our own uh, application that uh, specifies certain gates or generates entanglements. Um, uh, and then we can simulate this together. So you might then wonder, OK, we have a quantum network, so there should be entanglements between our laptops. But these are classical computers. So how can we have entanglement in such a network? And what we essentially do is we simulate this with classical communication between our computers. That essentially simulates the, the entanglement. And this works in a, in a way such that any qubits that are entangled will be simulated on one of our computers. We might not know which one. But if I have a, a qubit on a simulator on my laptop, you have a, a qubit simulator on your laptop, and they get entangled, one of them will move to either mine or to yours and stay in a combined state. And this is where the, the classical communication comes in. I won't go too much into the detail of this, but if you're interested, um, you can look more in the documentation, where we essentially have the notion of virtual qubits, which are essentially pointers to the actual simulated qubits, which might live on another node. Uh, in the network. Um, and we try to develop this in a kind of modular way. So um, the way we represent qubits are kind of detached from this distributed simulation. So we have different implementations of how we actually represent these qubits. So the first um, backend we used was using full density matrix matrices, actually using Q-tip. Um, and if you're more interested in Q-tip, there will be a talk, I think, the next or the one after by, by Boxy. Um, we also have backends um, essentially using uh, gets or vectors, which is using Project Q. And we have our own version of uh, stabilizer formalism, which is, of course, uh, you can simulate efficiently um, uh, in the number of qubits. And we can see, kind of see the... the the implication of choosing which formalism you want to simulate by looking at this graph. So here's the you generate a GSZ state, which is kind of a large entangled state, and you measure it. Uh, and this on the y-axis we have how much time it takes. And 
um, you can clearly see that both density matrices and kits have an exponential scaling in the number of qubits. While uh, it's maybe hard to see, it looks kind of flat. The stabilizer formula is essentially um, cubic in the number of, of qubits. Uh, and I should say, this is not a comparison of different simulators. It's purely about which formalism you, you use. Um, yes, OK. So I thought I would give a demo. Uh, this is maybe a, let's see if this was a stupid idea or not. If everything goes wrong, then, uh, then uh, at least I tried. But OK, so let me see if I can bring up my terminal. OK, um, is this visible in the back? Let me know otherwise. So to get started, uh, I want to show you all, everything from scratch. So I will, I will make a, a, a fresh a virtual environment in Python. Um, and uh, just as an uh, unrelated side note, if you ever struggled with virtual environments in Python, uh, check out my, my tool, which I call Manvan which is very nice to create uh, temporary virtual environments. Um, but first, we, uh, we make a temporary virtual environment. So now we're completely fresh. Um, we don't have, essentially, uh, many packages installed here. So this is how you get started. And let's now pip install uh, Simulacron. So it will pull down some packages. And um, one of these packages it actually uses is CQC which is this interface uh, that we can communicate with Simulacron. So now we have Simulacron. Let's clear this. Um, and we can then use our, this uh, command line tool. So you can just uh, run Simulacron. It has a few commands. Um, it's quite simple. Um, what, it, what it can do, for example, is to look at settings. So there are a few different settings. For example, uh, how many qubits should each node have? Um, for example, which backend do we want to use? So by, by default, the backend is uh, stabilized formalism. Um, but we can see, for example, um, we can choose uh, stabilized formalism, pretty Q, or, or Q-tip. Um, let's see if I'm doing it on time. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, so another thing we can, we can see is um, we can specify a, a network configuration file that describes how does the network we want to simulate look like, essentially what's, what's the, uh, um, the addresses of the nodes, what's the topology. Um, and I can show you an example of how this looks like. It's basically just a, um, uh, a JSON file. So let me go to the documentation. Let me zoom in a bit. Uh, so here is how you can configure a, a simulated network. Uh, let me go down to uh, here. So here's an example of basically you write a JSON file that specifies essentially your, the IP address and port numbers of your simulated nodes, since they can be on, on different computers. Uh, and you can also then specify a topology of your network. If you don't give it anything, by default, it's uh, fully connected. Uh, but otherwise, you can specify essentially a, a adjacency matrix. In this case, Alice is connected to Bob. Bob is connected to Alice and Charlie, and so on. Um, but that's how you uh, define your simulation. So let's now get started. So by default, we, have, we will have uh, five nodes. Uh, you can see this by uh, doing nodes and they get the ones to nodes in the network. So we have Alice, Bob, Charlie, David, and Eve, fully connected. And now let's uh, start Simulacrum. So it asks you if you want to replace your configuration file. You can force to do this. Uh, it's not uh, relevant. So now Simulacrum is started. So it's running in the background. And maybe let me remind you of this picture. Um, sorry, I should make this big screen. This picture that we have here, so 
Simulacron X as, a, as the backend, as the server, so it's running in the background, and we can now, uh, now write our application that actually sends these CTC messages to the simulation, in this case actually just using a, a TCP socket and sending these messages. So what we can now do is to just start Python uh, in interactive mode, and we can import from uh, CQC a CQC uh, connection and a qubit. Right, so the CQC connection enables us to connect to Simulacron, and in this case we can, for example, be, let's say we're now the node Alice, so we can start one of these CQC connection, and we're Alice, and I don't want to clutter my screen with a lot of uh, uh, debugging messages, so I set the log level uh, to essentially only errors. Great. So now we have a connection, and now we want to create a qubit. So we can create a qubit by essentially giving it the connection. And the reason for this is that whenever we then do an operation on these qubits, it will use the connection to send down the instruction to the hardware, or in this case, the simulation, to do the, the corresponding operation that we, we gave it. So now we have a qubit. We can, for example, do a Hadamard. Um, and as, a, as I mentioned now, a message is sent down to the, to the backend, do a Hadamard, a Hadamard is done, and we get a, a reply back, OK, it's finished. Um, how am I on time? How much time? Good. <laughs> so <laughs> I think it's been 20 minutes. OK, perfect. So. This is one node, but the point is that we now have a network, right? So let's, let's, let's have another node. So I open up a new uh, pane here, but you could also think about that, let's think that this new uh, window is actually on a different computer. It's a completely different process. Um, and since we made this, um, the uh, Python environment, we should also activate it here, so I activate it the last activated environment, this is temporary environment. And we can now open Python, and then in the same, uh, import this CQC connection and the qubit. Oh. Import. Cool. So let's say that in this case now we're Bob. So we make a CQC connection, uh, which is Bob. I don't want any log clean. Okay, cool. So now we have Alice and Bob, and let's create entanglement between Alice and Bob. So on Alice, we can say create an EPR pair with Bob, uh, and we will then get a qubit, and let's call this qubit uh, EPO. On Bob's side, we will also get a qubit. Let's call it also EPR. These are actually different qubits. Uh, and Bob will uh, receive uh, EPR. Great, so now we have a qubit on Alice and a qubit on Bob. They are entangled, but they are simulated entangled. Uh, we can also get some information about this entanglement. So, uh, get entanglement info. It, oh, let's print this. It has some information about the entanglement. So, um, in this network stack that we are developing, entanglement gets essentially an ID that you can use to identify who am I entangled with and which entanglement is it, so that the nodes can agree on which entanglement pair to use in the network. And we can, for example, also see uh, who am I entangled with. So we, in this lower case, here we're Bob. We have a qubit entangled with Alice. And let's now use this entangled pair to teleport a qubit. Uh, so we want to teleport this qubit Q that we already have. And maybe for you uh, who know about this, let's rem uh, remind you how you do teleportation. So we have some Bell pair and some qubits we want to teleport. We do a C naught and a Hadamard and we measure our qubits and send classical messages to the other node to apply certain corrections. If you don't know this, it's, uh, it's fine. Um, I just want to show you how it works. So let's do this. Uh, let's do a C naught between the qubit one teleports and the EPR pair. Let's do a Hadamard on the, the first qubit. Uh, let's measure it. 
and save the measurement outcome. Uh, in this case, it was zero. Uh, let's measure the other one. It's also zero. OK, maybe a bit boring. It's more exciting if you had to do a correction. Uh, so these are the measurement outcomes, and we now need to send these to Bob, because Bob needs to do the correction. Uh, so we can do this. We can say, Alice, uh, send a classical message to Bob uh, with the two measurement outcomes. And what Bob can then do is to uh, receive these classical messages. And OK, they were both zero in this case. But for example, if one of them was um, um, uh, one, we might have to do uh, an, let's say an x correction on the qubit of Bob. In this case, we didn't. So uh, since the qubit we teleported was actually in the plus state, if we now measure this qubit, we should randomly get either zero or one. Um, and let's measure this. OK, it was randomly one. Of course, we all see now that it's random. Of course, you cannot see this by just doing it one time. You have to do it many times and see that it's roughly one half, uh, zero and one. Um, but let me maybe go to an example. So how you would actually do this is not do it directly in the, uh, in the terminal. You can write a script, let's say uh, a Python script. In this case, Alice. You open up a C connection to the backend. You maybe generate an EPR pair in qubits and so on. And in this case, we actually open up a C connection in a, in a context, which is a, 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 a Python concept. Uh, and the reason is that when you then close this connection, or when it goes out of scope, it gets closed and qubits get cleared up. Um, but we have written these two applications for Alice and Bob. And we can now run these with this run script that essentially just um, puts these two processes in the background. Uh, so let's do this. Run. OK, cool. So now we teleported once more. Uh, Alice measurement outcomes with the teleportation was again 0, 0. And uh, both measurement outcome was 0. If we do this many times, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. OK, it's random. Cool. Um, so that's how we use simulacron. Um, and let me go back to this. So if you want to know more about simulacron, you can go to our, to our web page. There's also links to the actual code uh, and the documentation. And uh, if you want to write your own library in some other language that communicate with CQC, that's great. Uh, and also if you want to connect this with your, with your simulator, uh, that's maybe even better. Um, and we're happy for any contribution or questions or uh, thoughts. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank you. And if there's any questions. simulation but for the real network uh -huh. so you mentioned these two ways to build a network the IO connector and the other one and mm -hmm. which uh, states are the network between the one university and the other one and uh, which method you do you use yeah so for this network that we're building in in, uh, in, in the Netherlands at the moment it's this will use uh, these envy centers or nitrogen vacancies in diamonds because they are very nice in the sense that they have, um, they essentially have an electron, which you can entangle with another electron in another energy center. And around the electron, there's a bunch of uh, carbon spins, which you can use to store uh, qubits. And they have a very long coherence time. So they are nice because you can both uh, opti optically uh, entangle these qubits, but you can also store them for a long time and do gates on them. So that's why they're very interesting for, for this scenario. They might, not, they might be harder to scale. You might not be able to build a quantum computer with envy centers. But for many of our applications in a quantum network, we don't need many qubits, and we don't need fault tolerance. Uh, 
We just need a handful of qubits to do QKD, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, then let's thank the speaker. Thanks.